In today's Your Healthy Family, we're continuing with altitude sickness with Dr. John Hall with UC Health Pikes Peak Regional Hospital in Woodland Park, where he often treats a wide variety of people suffering from altitude sickness. I've seen it from 17 to 84. Doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter how, how often you've been coming here, your body's gonna acclimate to where you spend the most time. If you normally are in Phoenix, Arizona, Miami, Los Angeles, New Jersey, one of those cities that's pretty close to sea level, when you come up here, you're gonna have symptoms. The symptoms of being lightheaded, short of breath, nauseous, headache, chest pains don't necessarily strike the moment you arrive at a higher altitude. Sometimes that onset can be pretty rapid within just a few hours. Sometimes it can be a few days to even a week. A lot of times that depends on their activity. If they come up and you know are taking it easy, you know, visiting family, hanging out on the patio, that kind of thing, oftentimes it's some more indolent, subtle kind of changes. If they come up and hey, let's go ice climbing. Climbing. Let's go hike Pikes Peak. You're going to feel it right away. There are also health conditions that can make people more susceptible to altitude sickness, such as being older. We see patients all the time that come in. I've been coming here every summer for 40 years, and I have to remind them that they're not 40 years younger anymore. It's the people who are older have comorbidities such as heart failure, underlying pulmonary disease, asthma, cardiopulmonary disease, COPD. Altitude sickness may seem like a simple thing to avoid and head off at the pass, but it's even snuck up on Dr. Hall back when he was a resident living in Chicago. I'm an avid rock climber and ice climber, and I came out to do some ice climbing with my father-in-law. I was you know, hanging on the rope going, why can't I swing my axe? Why can't I kick my, you know, feet into the ice? Why, why can't I move? You know, I'd felt a little short of breath and, you know, I had a pretty good headache and I was a little nauseous and I was like, oh my God, what is going on? I explained this to my father-in-law who's a phenomenal ERPA. He's been doing this for 40 plus years and he's like, I think you have altitude sickness. I was like, no. He's like, yeah. I was like, no, nah, I run five miles a day. Come on, I can do this. He's like, no, I think you have altitude sickness. He's like, Think about it. You just got off the plane last night from Chicago, where you've been living, you know, for the you know the past couple of years, and now we're at 11,000 feet. He goes, I think you have altitude sickness. And sure enough, he starts to lower me down on the rope. And by the time I got on the ground, I felt great. I was like, How can just a couple hundred feet of elevation make that huge of a difference? And then obviously we kept hiking down. And by the time we got to the car and back to Lilton. I felt like I'm myself again. There are several ways to treat altitude sickness. The most definitive treatment and really the only definitive treatment for altitude related illness is descent to a lower elevation. We are very frequently telling people you need to go down to Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs is about 3,000 feet lower than us. So, and most people, as soon as they get down there, they feel immediately better. So we give them supplemental oxygen. We can give them IV fluids. We give them medicines that uh, are called diuretics that allow them to kind of get some of that fluid off because what happens is their lungs end up swelling. If you can imagine a sponge soaking up water, that's exactly what kind of goes on in the lungs. And that's where they're pushing that limit of pulmonary edema and they start getting into that diagnosis of high altitude pulmonary edema. Uh, and the swelling and the fluid collection on their lungs doesn't allow them to oxygenate very well. So then they start coughing up frothy sputum. So we give them diuretics to try and get some of that fluid off. In a best case scenario, before traveling to altitude, discuss it with your doctor. Let them know, hey, I'm going up to, an, uh, to Colorado, but we're gonna be staying at 9,000, 10,000 feet elevation. Make sure your doctor's aware of that. There are medications. There's one particular med medication called Diamox, which is the standard of care for anybody going to elevation. Uh, take it three days prior to coming up here. Uh, it's a single pill, take it twice a day um, for three days. And then when you come up here, it helps decrease the risk and decrease the symptoms of altitude related illnesses. Hydration helps just from uh, a standpoint of uh, when all the, all the fluid in your body starts to shift into your lungs, it's being sucked out of your uh, out of your veins and your arteries basically. So one of the things that you can do with a good hydration status is you're actually helping maintain that oncotic pressure to help keep the fluids out of your lungs. The best thing you can do is slow acclimation. When you fly into Colorado Springs or DIA or wherever you're going, stay there for two or three days, wait it out, get acclimated to that elevation, then come up to the mountains. Don't get off the plane in Colorado Springs, jump in your car and drive all the way up to Divide or Florissant or Cripple Creek where you're at nine, 10,000 feet and think you're gonna be feeling well. You're not, you're gonna be feeling miserable. Staying at a lower elevation for a few days, like I said, a typical healthy, normal person with no medical issues, usually two to three, four days, somewhere in there, the average is three, at a lower elevation to acclimate and then coming up to a higher elevation. Once they're here three or four days, their body acclimates and they usually feel fine. For your healthy family, I'm Ira Cronin.